Welcome to our second virtual gathering, or our third, if you count our coffee hour that we had last week. It was quite a success, I think. People seem to enjoy it, so we're going to have another one next uh, Wednesday morning at 10.15, and we hope that you will join us there. Keep your eyes open for an email. I'll let you know about that. Actually, I am amazed that two whole months have gone by since we left our old life behind. I don't know about you, but the time has gone by pretty quickly. And uh, I think I'm starting to see a light at the end of this tunnel. Before too long, it will only be six feet and a piece of cloth before I see many of you back at the rancho. It won't look the same, but um, we hope that a lot of you will want to come back and um, participate in the new manner that we will be opening the Rancho up. Meanwhile, we are so glad that you joined us this evening. I think you'll enjoy what we have planned for you today. We have something educational from Sarah about the Tongva, how she collaboratively created that exhibit and then turned it into a digital or virtual display. We have Marie with some wonderful, beautiful things, colorful from the garden so that you won't miss all the beauty of spring. And then some big news from Allison about how we will proceed with the opening. So let's, and of course, some very fun interactive polls for all of you. And then you'll all get to see and hear each other besides that. So, also you on YouTube. So let's get started with a couple of fun polls from Megan. Give, oh, I'm going to give Mallory a quick minute to check somebody. Um, Sorry, just uh, really quickly, um, I'm, I, we have one call in listener and what I'd like to do is I'm going to let that person allow to, um, I'm going to unmute that person. So if you are calling in and your the last four digits of your telephone number is 4363, I'm going to let you talk. Can you just let me know um, your name so that we can make sure that your voice is heard later on when we do our check-in? So go ahead and let us know who's on the line. Hi, this is Lori Adams. Okay, Lori, I'm going to just let um, our panelists know that that's who you are. All right, go back. We're going to... Go back to our program now. All right, so our first poll, we want to know in addition to Lori Adams, who is on the line? So Mallory is going to launch our first poll and you can tell us all the ways in which you help at Rancho Los Cerritos. You might be curatorial, you might be the gardens, museum shop, garden crafts, if you help in more than one way, we want to know all the ways. A docent during public hours, a school docent, someone who helps with public events, maybe a volunteer council member, a board member, a staff member. And I just wanted to jump in and say we do have Gabby and a few others tuning in from YouTube. So hello to all of you. Thanks for watching us on that platform. Awesome. If anyone wants to identify themselves on that platform, we would love to know who you are as well. But we're happy to have you, one and all. I actually haven't been at the Rancho since we were closed. Uh, staff could go in that weekend um, and get our stuff together from our desk. Um, so I think it's since the 21st of March that I haven't been at the Rancho, hence my background is speaking to where uh, a place I miss and like to help. About two thirds of you have finished voting, so we'll just give the rest of you time to do the same and then we'll know who's on the line. We'll give you one more minute and then Mallory will share that result.
Okay, Mallory, you want to go ahead and share the result? Look at that. We have a lot of people. We have 29 attendees and 11 uh, staff members on the line, but we have curatorial at 36%, docent at 64. This is my kind of math. <laughs> because we also have public events volunteers at 32 and curatorial. Oh, I already mentioned them. Sorry, museum shop at 23%. Uh, no board members and no staff. I think that's just a voting error because I see a lot of board members and I, I know uh, that we also have a lot of staff. So let us now move on to our second poll of the evening. Mallory, if you'll go ahead and launch this sort of offbeat poll, we thought we'd ask, what, where are you in the birth order? Wondering if volunteers and board members might be very special in the birth order. I stuck up a goofy picture of my sister and me, so now you know that I am the younger child in my own family of origin, uh, but one of the elder stateswomen here at the ranch show since I've been here for um, a long time. <laughs> 17 years and we have folks who have just been here. I think Krista's coming up on her one year anniversary, if I'm not mistaken about that. But we have a lot of wonderful staff. We have a lot of wonderful volunteers. Tell us where you are in the birth order. I'll show you an even goofier picture of my sister and myself just for fun while you're still voting. And our little dollies. Looks like we have a couple more people who might want to vote. We'll give you 30 more seconds. All right, Mallory, can you go ahead and share our results? Looks like 20% of us are the only child. Almost 40% are the oldest. 15 or somewhere in the middle, 31 like me, the baby of the family. And according to our results currently launched, we have no twins on the line, although certainly there are twins out in the world. All right, I am now going to turn uh, the show over. Sarah, Mallory can stop sharing the results and Sarah is gonna tell us all about her experience with a recent exhibit. Excellent. Thank you. I'm so thrilled you all are here. Uh, it's nice to see you, even if I can't actually see you. And what I want to do this evening is talk a bit about our Tongva exhibit, specifically uh, my experience putting it together, a bit of the history and background. Um, so let me share my presentation with you now. So one thing that I want to point out before I begin is the fact that I am not an expert. Um, the goal of this presentation is to share my experience of developing the exhibit and to talk about what I've learned through my research and what I've learned in my experience uh, working with Tongva people. And so I really encourage you to continue learning about the Tongva and towards the end of the presentation, I'll share some programs and resources where you can do this. So my goal when I started at Rancho Los Cerritos was to produce an exhibit about the indigenous people of the region, the Tongva Gabrielino. And I wanted to share the history of the Tongva and celebrate their culture and contributions in the present day. As I researched and as I assessed our collection, I quickly learned that we were very limited in terms of objects uh, that would enable us to interpret Tongva history and culture. We have a pretty sizable collection of Native American baskets. So I thought that at least a few of those must be Tongva. So we invited an expert to the site named Abe Sanchez, pictured here with me, um, to come and assess the basket. And Abe Sanchez is a talented basket weaver, and he's incredibly knowledgeable about baskets. He looked at our collection and he was able to tell me what materials the baskets were made from, and he was even able to tell me where they came from. Um, his assessment taught me that none of our baskets were Tongva. One basket was too matched with Tongva attributes, and this indicated the cultural exchange that took place between the two neighboring communities. Uh, we most likely ended up with the Native American baskets that we have from all over the United States in our collection, 
as a result of the basket trade that was so popular in the early 20th century. So when creating an exhibit about a community, it's incredibly important for curators to work with members of that community. And I was really lucky to work with the people photographed here, all of whom are Tongva. I first met educator Craig Torres in 2017 when I was referred to him by the folks at Rancho Los Alamitos because he does Tongva children's programs at their site. So we invited him to the rancho that year to present a lecture on Tongva food and land use traditions. I reached out to Craig once again to see if he would be willing to work on this exhibit, and luckily he was. Uh, Cindy Alvitre, who is next to me in the photograph, she's a professor of Native American Studies at Cal State Long Beach, and Desiree Martinez, standing on the other side of Craig, she's an archaeologist, and seated in the red blouse is Julia Bogany, and she's a cultural educator. And so these four Tongva educators and scholars contributed uh, and consulted on the exhibit they were very generous, gave of their time, gave of their knowledge, their expertise, and they really worked together to make this exhibit a reality. They also loaned personal objects to be displayed in the exhibit. And by having personal and family items from Tongva currently living in our region, the exhibit takes on a more personalized and contemporary tone. So when talking about the Tongva or when talking about any indigenous communities, it is so important to acknowledge the fact that they are not simply people of the past. European settlers have devastated Native American communities, but their descendants have fought to live on and carry their traditions and cultures. And so the Tongva are still here today. They're still part of the communities of Los Angeles and Orange counties. And the Tongva Gabrieleño were the first people in this region. They were the first to live at Rancho Los Cerritos. The Tongva were one of the wealthiest and most culturally influential native groups in Southern California. The Tongva inhabited the land reaching from Topanga Canyon in the Northwest to the base of Mount Wilson in the North, to the San Bernardino area in the East and to Aliso Creek area in the South, encompassing more than 2,500 square miles. They also lived on the Santa Catalina, San Clemente, and San Nicolas Islands off the Southern California coast. The Tongva did not live as one unified tribe or nation. Rather, they were organized into numerous village communities. And they maintained a thriving trade economy among these villages and with neighboring tribes like the Cahuilla and the Chumash. So most of our knowledge about Tongva history is based on oral tradition and on archeology. span we can also rely on written accounts from Spanish, Mexican, and American settlers, although they are often biased. Some notable written accounts include the 1852 letters of Hugo Reed, who was a Scotchman who settled in Los Angeles and married a Tongva woman named Victoria Reed, or Bartolomea, and the 1812 writings of Franciscan missionary Geronimo Bostano. The name Tongva means people of the earth. And living up to their name, the Tongva have traditionally looked to the land for survival. They settled near food and water sources, relying on the present day Los Angeles, San Gabriel, and Santa Ana rivers and local springs, as well as of course the Pacific Ocean. Many plants have multiple uses for the Tongva, which helps eliminate waste and protects against overharvesting the environment. And we have examples of some of these plants in the native garden at the rancho, such as elderberry, buckwheat, and bladder pod, pictured here. These are used for multiple medicinal purposes, plant dyes, instruments, games, and as food sources. The Tongva village of Tevahagna was located on land that would later become Rancho Los Cerritos. Tevahagna was one of many Tongva villages in the Los Angeles basin. And there are two possible translations for the village name of Tevahagna. Uh, one possible translation is in the old houses, and another possible translation is among the hills. And although the exact location of the village is uncertain, it may have been located near where the adobe stands today. In 1878, noted ethnologist Paul Schumacher 
came to the Rancho and did an excavation. He uncovered Native American artifacts and he sent his findings to the Peabody Museum or to the Smithsonian. We're not quite exactly sure which museum, but we know that he sent them to one or possibly both. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to track down these items. So there's been a series of correspondence between curators at the Rancho and curators at this museum over the past few decades. Um, and even more recently, Desiree Martinez, the Tongva archeologist we worked with, she also researched the catalogs for these museums and she was not able to find any, um, any of the Rancho Los Cerritos artifacts. Uh, so we have documentation that they were found and they were sent, but we haven't been able to track them down. And this may be because these items were traded with other museums, possibly even in Europe, uh, because this was really common practice in the early years of museums, unfortunately. So pictured here, we see 11 cogged stones. And these date from 5,000 to 8,000 years ago. And they were discovered under the foundation of the adobe when the home was remodeled in 1930. There were also archaeological digs that were conducted at the rancho between 1957 and 1965 by one of our earliest curators. And these also produced Native American artifacts. And the objects from these digs may date back to the Tevahagna village or to the Native American laborers who worked at Rancho Los Doritos in the 19th century. Beginning in 1771, Spanish missionaries forced the Tongva to live at the San Gabriel mission. The Tongva suffered terribly under the mission system. And they were forced to adopt Catholicism and a new culture and way of life that separated them from an identity and existence that was embedded in the land. They were subjected to brutal and forced labor. As a result of this and the spread of diseases, their health suffered drastically and many Native Americans died. The Tongva resisted the mission system from the beginning. One example was an uprising in 1785 led by a medicine person named Toiparina. She refused to convert to Catholicism and was angry that the priests were living on her people's ancestral land. As a result of the continuing harsh policies and the mistreatment of Native Americans into the Mexican and American period, many Tongva would identify as Mexican as a form of protection and self-preservation. Unfortunately, what this also did was decrease the community's visibility and contributed to the inaccurate belief that the Tongva had died out. When the missions were secularized in 1833, many local Native Americans moved to Los Angeles or to neighboring ranchos to find work. In return for their labor, they received food and shelter, but usually little else. Native American workers at the ranchos, vineyards, and other enterprises would be paid in alcohol. They would then get arrested for being drunk. The Native Americans would be auctioned off in present day downtown Los Angeles, where bidders would pay their bail in exchange for their labor. They would again be paid in liquor, and the cycle would continue. As lawyer and journalist Horace Bell described at the time, quote, Los Angeles had its slave mart, as well as New Orleans and Constantinople. Only the slave at Los Angeles was sold 52 times a year as long as he lived, end quote. While the sources are limited and it is not confirmed, it is possible based on this context and the extensive labor that was required to build the adobe at Rancho Los Doritos that John Temple may have taken advantage of the system of purchasing Native American labor at the Los Angeles auction. Tongva and other Native Americans would have had the skills at this time to build an adobe structure after working at the missions. Furthermore, his records indicate that he purchased aguardiente alcohol, which was used as payment for Native American labor. There is strong evidence that Abel Stearns who owned neighboring Rancho Los Alamitos during this time, purchased Native American labor at the Los Angeles auction. His administrator, Charles Henry Brinley, wrote Stearns in 1852, recommending that he appoint someone to attend the auction and, quote, buy me five or six Indians, end quote. Temple, or at least his representative at Rancho Los Doritos, is documented for mistreating Native American laborers as well. Brindley hired a Native American worker named Carino, who fled an impending flogging at Rancho Los Doritos, 
and bragged that he would secure all of Temple's workers because his Maya Domo was, quote, too much of a sultan among them, much to their disgust, end quote. This suggests that Native Americans were mistreated as laborers on the Rancho Los Cerritos cattle ranch. And it also emphasizes the ways that they were able to resist and exert some measure of control over their labor and their treatment. In 1924, the United States government granted citizenship to all Native Americans. Despite widespread belief that the Tongva were extinct, over 100 Native Americans self-identified as Gabrielino on the California Indian Judgment Roll of 1928. The Tongva Gabrielino became more politically involved in the 20th century. The 20th century brought the Tongva to the political stage on many fronts, fighting for compensation for land and the reinterment of their ancestors' remains, working to save landmarks of cultural importance, acting to educate the public about their history, and struggling for recognition from the federal government. In the late 20th century, Tongva formed political, educational, and cultural organizations to preserve their culture and educate the public. They are working toward gaining federal recognition for the Tongva Gabrielino. There are numerous sites, organizations, and other initiatives in the region that aim to educate the public about indigenous history and culture. I'd like to highlight just a few that the Tongva scholars I worked with also contribute to. So the first one is the Chia Cafe Collective, and you can see some examples of their goods on the right-hand side in my slide. And this is a grassroots group of Native American educators in Southern California. Their mission is to honor the land and educate others about preserving native plants, habitats, and food practices. And the collective also has published a book, a cookbook titled Cooking the Native Way, Chia Cafe Collective and the Ethnobotany Project. The next organization is called the Tiat Society. And the Tiat Society celebrates the coastal heritage of the Tongva people. Uh, the story goes that one night about 30 years ago, Cindy Alvitra's ancestors came to her in a dream. They were paddling across a lake in wooden canoes that she had never seen before. Two weeks later, Jim Noyes of the California Indigenous Maritime Association contacting her, asking if she would be interested in building a tiat, the traditional canoe of the Tongva. He described the boat that Cindy had seen in her dream. And they formed the Tiat Society to bring this boat to life and named it Mumat Ahiko. And this is Tongva for Breath of the Ocean. It's also a name of a street in Santa Monica right next to Tongva Park. Uh, Mumat Ahiko was the first modern Tiat in Southern California. And it has been used for over 20 years in a variety of ceremonial voyages, including participation at the Tiat festivals on the island of Pimu, or Catalina. Mumat Ahiko is still in use today, and the image on the center of this slide is of a textile created by Cindy Alvitre representing her dream, and it is featured in our Tongva exhibit at the Rancho. The Pimu Catalina Island Archaeology Project is a collaborative research project that uses an indigenous archaeology approach, and that's what's featured in the bottom photo. Court archaeology done with, for, and by indigenous people. Their research has been shaped by discussions with Tongva community members who have special interests and familiar ties to the Catalina Islands. Uh, they run an archaeology field school that exposes archaeology students to the history and culture of the Tongva while being taught archaeological methods. The school has trained over 130 students and Native American community members from all over the country. Uh, pictured on the right side is Pavagna. And this is a sacred village and burial site of the Tongva Gabrielenio people, part of which is located on the campus of Cal State Long Beach. Pavagna remains sacred to the Tongva Gabrielenio as a spiritual center. Uh, Pavagna serves as host to various events that honor the sacred space, including an ancestral walk, solstice, and memorial gathering. And we also have the powwow that takes place on Cal State Long Beach's campus, featured on the left side, left hand side of the slide. Um, and Rancho Los Cerritos does participate in that powwow. Unfortunately, it had to be canceled or perhaps postponed this year. Uh, featured in the bottom image is Caravagna Springs Nature Center. And this is located at University High School in West Los Angeles. 
It once contained a thriving, self-contained village. And Turavogna means a place where we are in the sun. Artifacts and ancestors were uncovered during construction of the school and the land surrounding it. And these items, along with historical documents, photographs, and other resources documenting the history of the Tongva, are now on permanent display at the Caravagna Springs Nature Center. Uh, we also have Mapping Indigenous LA. This is another initiative that the um, Tongva scholars that I worked with are also involved with. Uh, so this is a story mapping project that represents a collaboration between UCLA researchers, community organizations, and local indigenous communities that seek to acknowledge the multiple layers of indigenous Los Angeles. And it's on a website which aims to highlight the rich native history of Los Angeles. And the project moves beyond simply consulting census data and human statistics by also working with communities to bring people's stories to life through maps. So we have links and information about these initiatives and other initiatives related to Tongva history and culture on our website. Speaking of our website, uh, we recently created a virtual version of the Tongva exhibit in response to the Safer at Home protocols so that folks can continue to visit the exhibit online. Uh, the public can access the exhibit while we are staying at home and can continue to access the exhibit after we return to the site and once the exhibit is deinstalled and the objects are returned to their owners who graciously extended the object loans given the circumstances. So I thank you for your time today and I thank you for the opportunity to discuss a bit of Tongva history and culture. I really hope the conversation doesn't end here. I hope the conversation doesn't end with us physically deinstalling the exhibit. Please feel free to ask questions right now, contact me with questions as they come up to you later on. I may not know the answer, but I can certainly help you find it. And my goal is to really inspire folks to learn about the Tongva and to look at our community as an indigenous space. So I now welcome any questions you may have. Sarah, that was a really interesting presentation. Could you, if we don't have any questions or until we get some, also give a shout out to uh, your Arts Council intern and the exhibit he just put online? Absolutely. Uh, we do have one question. So let me um, mention the exhibit you just brought up and then we'll come back to the questions. So uh, another exhibit that was recently put online was um, installed by our creative Long Beach intern, Anthony Smyers. And he um, comes to us through the Arts Council for Long Beach. And he um, was able to, he, before all the safer at home uh, protocols were put into place, he was working very hard on an exhibit that was focused on tea. And he was ready to start installing. And then the following week, of course, we all needed to start working remotely. And he quickly uh, shifted gears and he was able to put the exhibit online. So that exhibit is now live. And I hope she won't mind me mentioning her, but um, Anthony collaborated with Kim Bamowski, who shared a lot of her research about tea. So um, those two worked, worked together very well on putting our tea exhibit online. Um, so that is now live and available to the public. So it's another way that we can share our collections and we're gonna continue um, putting, putting our exhibits and our collections online. So we got a question, uh, Sarah. Someone wants to look, know how long it took to develop the exhibit. Um, I would say from the time that I started planning it to when it was installed, uh, probably about two and a half years. Sure. It took a long time. There was, there were some starts and stops because, you know, it's a bit challenging when you have an idea for an exhibit and then you realize that you don't have the collections for it. So. Um, I, had, I had always planned on working with the community, but I didn't plan on having almost the entire exhibit be based on loans. And so we had to get very creative, but I'm, I'm really happy about the fact that, um, that it is, you know, largely made up of personal items so that it just has that really personal touch. But yeah, it took a while, about two and a half years. And we have another question. What does bladder pod do for you or the Tongva? So bladder pot, I can't remember exactly. Maybe Marie can jump in if she remembers. I know there were medicinal purposes. I think part of it was digestive. Um, I can look back in my notes. I have 
much more notes I had to I had to of course condense for this so I can look into that I think it's digestive Marie do you have more to say on that I started to put you on the spot yes well there is there is medicinal but they also used the fruit which is the bladder as food and it had a spicy flavor similar to jalapeno and so they would incorporate that when you think of how bland acorn mush is anything with flavor has to be a benefit. So that was one of the primary uses for bladder bod. There's a lot more that we could go into it about it and we probably shouldn't spend the time here doing that. You know me, I'll go on forever. But uh, so that's one really good strong detail about the bladder pod. Thank you, Marie. Um, we had a person ask about uh, what the cog stones were used for and I, Think I know that we we don't know isn't that correct Sarah yeah so that's a great question and we're not sure um, so archaeologists and historians they're not in agreement there's there's not really a clear understanding of what they were used for there are hypotheses but it, it's not been confirmed and what's really interesting is they they are not widespread they've really only been found in Southern California so that's that's one hint but we're really not sure which is very interesting it is very interesting we did have some comments in the chat also, Sarah, um, with positive feedback. Marsha is glad you finally got to present this and says, good thank job. Thank you, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Leslie thank says, thank you so much for your collaboration with local Tongva scholars and leaders and for sharing this new information and perspectives that we don't always get to hear. <clears throat> and then Terry apparently at the Bowers saw a tool that kind of looked like the our cogstones that was at the end of a stick. So there's mm -hmm. there is they've shown that, up yeah. in different places, but yeah, it's, it's still a question. We don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. All right. Well, um, on that note, I think I will hand it back over to Megan. But again, if you have any other questions, if you're thinking about this later and questions come up to you, please email me. Um, I hope I've sparked your interest. We do have a link on our website with resources for um, links when possible, but for the reading, we have a video on there, we have other um, initiatives in the region. So I really encourage you to keep learning and um, stay interested and, and thank you all so much. And with that, I will hand it back over to Megan. Sarah, thank you. I will add to the coolness of that exhibit, our long ago Long Beach children last year, third graders learn about the natives in their area. And so we brought them down into the basement of the visitor center and they were just so thrilled, first of all, to learn that there is a basement because I'd say it's a two story building, where's the rest of it? So they had to suppose that so they figured it out, walked down the back stairs and they were just in awe. And then we brought them out into the California native garden, some of which you might see later. Hey, we're ready for another kind of offbeat poll. Working up our volunteer profile. So far, Laura, you need to recruit middle children because that's who most of our volunteers are. The next one we're going to ask you about, go ahead and launch it. But if you can see my screen as well, low tech. These are the Rancho's pets. They're ruling the roost, I hear, at Rancho Los Cerritos. Tell us what your favorite type of pet is. It doesn't have to be one you own. Although here's one I own. <laughs> uh, this is my dog, Kodiak, who is currently not in the building, so he is not barking at anything. Um, we have about half of you so far have told us what your favorite pet is. I'll say it's running strong between dogs and cats, but others are coming in as well. This is really crucially important to um, how we recruit volunteers, that they're middle children and then we need to secretly know what their favorite pet is. We have about 25 of you have voted. We'll give you another 30 seconds or so. Uh, Megan, if I could jump in for a second. Um, one of our long ago Long Beach interns outreach educators is following on youtube and she when we were talking about um taking the kids down for the tongva she said that she really loved teaching the kids about the tongva during long ago long beach hi gabby <laughs> yay well it could be aaron i don't know they're probably both out there in virtual land all right mallory can you go ahead and share that despite my effort to 
rigged the poll. Dogs came in at 41. They were edged out by cats. And there are a few uh, voters. Oh, that would have helped the dogs if the fish and other voters didn't go for that. Did anyone describe in chat or on YouTube uh, what other might be, Alana or Krista? Um, no other, but Sally loves cats because you have to earn their trust and love. And <laughs> that's true. Marsha was going to say pet rock, but then Laureen looked up at her, so she felt compelled to choose dog. Laureen um, is. And then dog. <laughs> Elizabeth was betting Terry would say horses, and Terry agreed. So <laughs> no surprise to those of us who have gotten to see some of his pictures with his horse friends during the quarantine. All right, thank you for answering that poll. I have spent COVID-19 with my fellow staff members on a lot of Zoom calls, which is pretty awesome. Mallory, will you launch the poll? But here's what else I do for fun. Oh, same dog. <laughs> now ready to go for a walk. Can you tell us if you're exercising or reading you can vote for more than one, I believe, although you should double check that. You might be cleaning, you might be thinking, you might be Zooming, you might be watching TV. A lot of different options here. You can always vote or just tell us if you're dialing in or if you are on the YouTube link, the options that we put up are reading, cooking, cleaning, exercising, thinking, zooming, TV, gardening, sewing, and other, and we hope you'll tell us what you mean by other. I have always had cats. I love cats. I'm just going to disclose that, but the thing I like about the dog is the well, he's cute, but also how much exercise I get. I walked 50 miles last week and I'm super proud of that. We'll give you about 30 more seconds. Go ahead, Alana. Terry's been doing jigsaw puzzles and apparently just finished a 1500 piece. Um, as not much of a puzzle person, that seems very intimidating. So congratulations Super on that. impressive. I thought about it. I know a lot of our ranch has staff do that. Go ahead, Alana. <laughs> um, we got a couple others. Um, Diana Trombley's been boating in the open ocean and the bay. Sherry's been wow. walking with Elizabeth. Um, and Terry also just played his first round of golf today. So it was all. <laughs> and if Alice is talking to share, share puzzles, so. If, yeah. if people want to set up a puzzle sharing, that seems like there might be some yeah, and for that. Gabby over in the YouTube comments said she's just trying to relax during this time. <laughs> and I definitely share that sentiment. We're now sharing the poll results and it looks like a lot of people are exercising. How cool. And a lot of people are reading. That's our group, right? A lot of people are cooking. Maybe some of us are cooking way more than we used to. There's a lot of good content on TV and now we have time to do it. Gardening comes in. Um, all of those are over 50%. Hey, even cleaning is over 50%. Awesome. Uh, anything else to share, Krista or Alana? Um, yes, we have. Let's go back. Uh, Sally is ordering everything online and cleaning up many years of accumulated stuff. Um, Sherry's learning to do the computer Zoom. Aren't we all, Sherry? Um, Elizabeth's also playing games with friends online, so I've been doing some of that too. Uh, and Floyd and Nancy are also doing jigsaw puzzles and getting active with photography. And Floyd built a table. Maybe we can see it later when we go to videos. That's it from the chat so far. Fantastic. I'm going to hand it over to Marie, who's been quite a bit at the Rancho, and she has a very special presentation for us. Well, I want to uh, reassure you that um, the Rancho is doing, is growing and blooming, and I have heard a lot of comments of how much you miss 
spring, the expected spring that you thought you would see uh, this year. So as I was taking photographs, I decided to put together a slideshow for you to see what some of you have been asking about. And this is some of the stuff that has, that has bloomed while you, while you couldn't be at the Rancho. So I'm going to go ahead and start the slideshow. It's just over four minutes. Uh, and I won't talk through it. There's music in the background. And it isn't a test. It's just there for your enjoyment.
So that's just a little bit of what bloomed between the pedestrian gate and the California Native Garden. There are two more movements to the Valdez uh, Spring, and we have more parts of the rancho that are exhibited there, but I wasn't going to overwhelm you tonight. Uh, this will be something that Krista and Allison and I will probably figure out how to get it online someday. Um, I want to reassure you that there are more flowers blooming still. I really hope that you get to see them soon. And if not, Vivaldi had four seasons and summer's next. So I'm going to pass it back right now to Tessa. And I hope that you all realize how much I miss all of you wonderful volunteers. And I am looking forward to seeing you again. And so is the garden. And I didn't take include a single weed in any of these photographs. But let me tell you, they're just as happy. I hope that you have a good night and I look forward to talking to you soon another time. Thank you, Marie. Um, that was absolutely beautiful. And, um, you know, I don't know if it's something I want to see because it reminds me how much I miss being able to walk around. Um, so it's helpful and painful. <laughs> Um, but hi everyone. Good evening. It's so good to see everybody. I've had the opportunity to speak with some of you recently, which has been great as well. I want to just give you sort of a brief overview of what the development department has been working on. Um, development consists of me, Mallory, Krista, Andreina, Sue, and then of course Claire and Allison. And um, it was our department that sort of moved quickly to take everything that education does and everything that Sarah does with curatorial and move it into online platforms. Um, so even folks like Mallory, whose position is not necessarily website focus, jumped in with um, all her enthusiasm and both hands and started creating the long ago Long Beach videos. So we're working really hard to get all of the external communications like the website and e-blasts and the exhibits and um, programming online. So you can still experience it um, even through this period while the ranchos closed. We're also working on um, funding sources. I'm sure as many of you have heard uh, through you know, the, the news and other nonprofits you're involved in, um, it's, very it's a very difficult time for nonprofits, but we're working really hard on emergency funding opportunities and have been submitting grants, thank you Andreina, um, and getting the language correct there about all of these online programs uh, that we'll continue to do and hopefully continue to raise funds for. Um, we're also looking at things like expanding our membership program uh, to have virtual offerings for that as well. Um, so if you're already a member and you haven't heard from me yet, it's just because of where you're at in the alphabet, and I promise I'll be calling you soon uh, to get your feedback. Um, if you'd like to join membership or if you have ideas about how we can offer virtual membership, I'd be happy to hear from you. So our, our campaign and our fundraising efforts continue on in this new way. Um, and we're happy to be here with you tonight. And um, I just want to thank you all for everything you do because it's a great reminder about what we're working so hard to fund uh, is th these incredible exhibits like what Sarah shared tonight and what Marie just shared with us. Um, that's what gets me up every day to come to work. So um, thank you so much to all of you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Allison who's going to share our reopening plans with you and um, how you can continue to help. So thanks so much. Allison, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Tess. I learned how to unmute myself when I talk. So that is like a big accomplishment. Um, and I'm trying to figure out the lighting in the one room that I have <laughs> for these Zoom calls. So hopefully you can see me. I kind of feel like sometimes like 
a little bit dark, but this is the best lighting I can do in my office. Um, my husband and I share our townhouse and we're doing the best we can to uh, make this work. However, for this group, I am very thrilled to say that uh, outdoor museums and the ranchos, uh, Cerritos and Alamitos, have been permitted to open. And so we are looking at um, early June and we are definitely going to need your help with that. Um, the idea is, is that we are in phase one. We're working through our cleaning and sanitizing schedules, um, staff schedules, and what it looks like to open to the public. And we have been told through the state and then Long Beach as well, because we're going through Long Beach and then state protocols, that we can open for active participation, including so social distancing. So what that means for us in phase two is that we can open the gardens to the public. Hi, Marie. Um, so what that means is we can have people walk through the California Native Garden through the backyard. We cannot open the Adobe Home. We can't open the Visitor Center and we can't promote social gatherings. Um, but what we can do is promote a place of enclosed self meditation in an area to walk around in. And so we are looking for volunteers whether they, whatever volunteer capacity you're in to be able to help with that on site. Our idea is to open in early June. And that is, you know, with some optimism and I think that is very possible, but we do need volunteer help, whether you're a volunteer or you're a docent, however that looks, we need people to help with checking people in we're going to do this uh, with ticketed reservations on site. They're free. Also allowing for walk-ins because we know we have community that like to walk into the site. Um, and so there's, these people can walk through the native garden. They can walk through the backyard. Megan and education staff have been diligently working at creating an online app via Clio that will have more information um, about the gardens. Marie has also been working on a handout that is safe and sanitized that we can give to people to walk through the gardens. We're also going to encourage people just to walk on the site. We can't encourage picnics or social gatherings but we can encourage people to walk through the site. And we're truly hoping that the volunteers can help with that. This will be part of phase two. Phase three, when it is approved, will be for people to be able to do self-guided tours through the house and the gardens. And then phase four, which we are expecting to be in 2021, hopefully at the beginning, um, will be for our more large formatted programming where we can host larger events, we can have docent led tours, et cetera. But in phase two and phase three, we're really looking for your help, your expertise, and how you want to help out at the site because we want all of our wonderful volunteers back. We want to make sure you feel comfortable with coming back. We have different opportunities. And after this, uh, after this Zoom call, Laura will be sending Laura will be sending out a Zoom or excuse me, a survey about how people want to volunteer, whether it's virtual, in person. Do you want to be a greeting person as people come on site? Do you want to help us with guiding people in a socially distanced way on site through the California Native Garden and through the backyard? Are you comfortable with helping us sanitize the different areas that we have to do? But really, we're looking for your help and your guidance. 
about how you all want to volunteer on site or virtually. There are virtual opportunities, whether it's helping create content or, you know, as a group making masks, who knows? I mean, there's a variety of opportunities, but really our goal is to open the site in early June to be a sanctuary for people who want a piece of respite a beautiful place to go. So we want to be able to do that, but we do need your help for that. So our goal is early June with volunteers. Marie is of course looking because she has been battling the weeds, the hedges. I mean, there's even weeds in the DG, which I don't even think could exist. Um, so we need help with garden volunteering. So we need help across the board. <clears throat> so we're looking to you to help us open. We've given the go ahead to, we're good to go. We can open. We want to make it, you know, early June. So we've got everything in, in place, but we're excited. We have an opportunity. We are considered an outdoor museum with gardens and when we can open the visitor center and or the house, we have an opportunity to let people on our site to experience the beauty that is the Rancho. And then in phase three, the idea is when that comes to pass that we will be able to open the Adobe to self-guided tours. And so we're looking for you know guidance and help with that as well. And then, as I said, in the beginning of, two, of 2021, to open up to self-guided tours, guided tours, virtual tours, events, Mud Mania will be back. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity as we move forward. Uh, we're also looking at this summer, live streaming our July and August concerts. So staff has been working super hard on making all of our content that is online, that was one person, is now online. So there's a lot of opportunity here. So we're looking to your help and your guidance about how our volunteers, docents, can help out with this. So I'm opening up to Q&A. So please, if there's any questions. We do have, um, we had a couple questions in the Q&A box about um, one-way traffic and if people will have to wear masks. Yes, so <clears throat> per state and then Long Beach protocols, because there's any type of social gathering, people do have to wear masks. Now, I will say, I don't know how public this is gone but we are investigating and looking at Rancho Los Cerritos logoed masks. How cool. This would be an opportunity for a staff, board, and volunteers to get these. But the idea is, yes, anytime you interact with another person, you do have to wear a mask. So we're, Krista is working on developing those we will also have um, disposable masks on site in case for some reason a public person comes on site and they don't have a mask. We, want, we don't want to turn anybody away. We want to give them a mask so they can experience the site. Um, so we're doing that. In terms of the routes, yes. If you, the idea is if you go into the, if you come on site, you buy your ticketed reservation online or your walk-in, you can go into the visitor garden, you can go into the California garden by the, um, the landmark, and then you would exit through the stairs. A more accessible route is that you would go to the orchard, tour the backyard, and then exit, of course, by the donation box into the Fort Court parking lot. So we have two routes. We're not saying you have to be super particular to those routes, but we do need to um, emphasize the whole active participation because it can't be just sitting, having a picnic. Our picnic area will be closed, but we want to um, 
activate the site in terms of walking. And then um, I know Laura answered Leslie's question in the Q&A box, but I know other people might also be wondering um, what the impact is for school tours of all of this. Or when so that, come back. That is a, that's a very fascinating question and is one that we have been addressing. <clears throat> is that, um, as many people probably know at this time, is that the Cal State system has moved all of their fall classes online. So they aren't doing in-class systems. The UC system, and I've been talking to them, is doing is considering the same thing. And so that what that means for school tours is that school tours will not look the same in the fall. Is um, Long Beach Unified hasn't announced anything, neither has uh, LA Unified. But this time, school tours most likely will not be happening. What does that mean for us, though? An opportunity. It means an opportunity for creating school tours online, having or school tour docents rather than being on site if they're comfortable with camera, is having them doing school tours online, and then we can give that programming to the school districts. It also offers us an opportunity for our school tour docents to be on site, offering information on typical tours when we start those in phase three for the house, or even in phase two, coming on site in costume, you know, at social distancing to offer information to our visitors. So there's opportunities there. Um, but no, traditional school tours won't be in effect, at least in the fall of 2020. Hopefully they'll come back in 2021. Uh, but there are definitely opportunities for school tour docents, our living history docents, garden docents, house docents, to be on site to impart information to people in a slightly different manner. And then could you just one more time to quickly summarize which spaces are open in each of the phases, like in a couple words, like when the house versus gardens versus visitor center opens? Sure, no problem. I do, I do want to preface this, that this information is at 6.38 on May 19th of 2020, because I think as all of us know, this is a moving target. But right now, phase two has opened up. So our idea, our goal, is that with volunteer participation and staff participation, we will be able to open the gardens to the public in June. Phase three is dependent upon what the state and city guidelines are. But right now, that is looking at the fall. And in the fall, the idea is that we would open the house to self-guided tours. What does that mean? It means you won't have docents leading from the visitor center through the different exhibit rooms, but we could have people going to the house with docents stationed throughout the house to give people information at a socially distanced perspective. Then phase four, which we're looking at right now is the beginning of 2021, would be to have, depending on people's comfort levels, self-guided tours, guided tours, and virtual tours. Thank you. Um, and if anyone is worried that they have not memorized all of that information, don't worry, we'll be sending out a letter or email soon um, with all of this written out. So you'll be getting it again. Um, but thanks, Allison, for answering those questions. And then I guess also, Alana, if I can add, in terms of volunteer opportunities, is <clears throat> Marie will be reaching out to garden volunteers to come back on site because they can in phase two. So I don't know, she's doing like a happy dance, I'm seeing. So that's pretty cool. Um, 
And then we'll also be reaching out to our curatorial, curatorial volunteers and other volunteers who necessarily aren't docents as to what they can do and how they can come back. But our idea is that the next couple months, oh my gosh, and there's Nicholas and he is totally vetting curatorial volunteers. So if you're a curatorial volunteer, you gotta get past Nicholas, just to be clear. Um, <clears throat> but on a serious note, no, we want volunteers to come back. We love all of you. We want you back on site. We're doing it in a super safe manner, um, but we're excited to have everyone come back. Thank you, Allison. I am really excited to have everyone come back too, but only if you feel completely comfortable. We're making it as safe as we can, and we still understand that not everybody will, but we do have plenty of room for volunteers to help out with this. So now we are going to move on to the part of this evening where we get to, you get to see each other and we get to see you instead of just knowing that you're there. So one last thing, this is uh, being broadcast live to YouTube. And all of you that are here tonight, I can see your faces and I've written down that you're here and I'm gonna be recording your volunteer hours for that. I don't get to record very many of those these days. So I'm really glad that I have some volunteer hours. But if you're on YouTube watching it later on, I don't know about that unless you tell me. So please, uh, people watching this later on, let me know so I can give you those volunteer hours. So now it's time to hear from all of you. So you will do that by, if you have video, raising your hand and I can call on you. And um, just say hi, let us know what you've been doing or something that's happened that wouldn't have happened otherwise if uh, these times weren't as they were. And I'll share something kind of crazy that happened in my life that I don't think would have happened otherwise. I had to cut my hair myself. <laughs> so very Victorian wise, <laughs> I, I have it here. Um, maybe I'll make something out of it. I don't know, but <laughs> it was got way too long. All right, so who would like to start first? Hey guys, I can't wait to get back. I've missed you, Marie. I walk up to the Rancho once a week and I stand at the gate and I just pine to get in and I can't wait to get back once a month to do the birds. I mean, I just really miss it. We all do. Uh, Lori can't let us know that she wants to. So I'll go to unmute you, Lori. Did you want to say hi to everybody? Lori Adams on the phone. Hi. <laughs> I didn't realize you were talking to me. I was. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Missed you all. Um, yeah. I've just been keeping busy in the garden. Not my garden. My neighbor's garden. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's about it. But I miss everybody. I miss the rancho. Um, as soon as we open up, I'll have visitors coming. All right. We'll be glad to see you all. All right. Who else, wants, who else wants to go? I'm a newbie at all of this, so I have oh. no idea. Raising my hand vanished. <laughs> okay. Well, you're on, so say hi. Oh, hello, everybody, and a big Thank you to Elizabeth, who is the one who actually is trying to train me how to do all of this stuff. She's dragging me kicking and screaming into the 20th century. And if she lives, we might make it to the 21st. Um, yeah, gardens, records, and I, yeah. Gardens and records are about it. And I can't wait to get back to the rancho because I see it every day and I can't get in. <laughs> Take care, Laura. <laughs> all right. Good to see you all. Um, looking forward to coming back. And I wanted to um, give a shout out to Terry. Thank you for your um, 
your little messages that you send updating us on uh, what's going on in your life. It's been fun. Good to see everybody. Great. Okay, well, I was uh, watching Ron Grease button up his shirt there and wonder what was going on. <laughs> He's, He's got, got a pretty sneaky hat on, too, to hide, hide his face. <laughs> anyway, I everything I do at the Rancho, um, I keep bugging everybody at this on staff level. Can I come in and clean the pots and pans or whatever I do? Anything to do there. And uh, I'm anxious to get started with whatever they want me to do, with the exception of probably standing in uh, uh, sitting at a desk in front of everybody when they come in. Uh, I would rather be moving around a little bit. I can't sit still very long. Matter of fact, the last time we, this thing was so long, it was, didn't see me. I had to hide the video so I could get up and run around the living room and come back and sit down again because I can't sit still that long. <laughs> but yeah, I'm very anxious. And I will be sending an email with Terry's tidbits, uh, history tidbits, pretty soon. I have a whole lot. Um, Specifically, uh, interesting one about Stearns and a casket I'll be telling you all about. Ron and Leslie probably already know all about that one. Right? No? When they went to drop his casket in the grave, the ropes broke and spilled all the contents out? You didn't hear about that one? <laughs> no, you're going to have to inform us, Terry. <laughs> And by the way, with the Tongva Indians, about half of them died in Los Angeles of the, the um, what was it, the, some kind of a bad disease that went around, like the plague. That will be coming to you too soon. <laughs> like to keep that going so that you remember the rancho, right? Hey, <laughs> can you hear me? I can. Okay. Hi, Tom. Hi. I miss everybody. Just wanted to say hi and uh, keeping busy in the garden and whatever you guys need for volunteering is fine. I can wash, clean, do gardening, weed, everything I, I'm very well adjusted to right here. <laughs> but, Wonderful. Uh, but everything's good. I mean, uh, it's all different, but it's all good and we'll get through it all. And I'm looking forward to being a real docent and guiding people through someday. But um, until then, just use me, whatever you need. <laughs> I said, if Tom talks, I have to. There's a little competition in our docent class here. I have visions <laughs> of him having memorized that book already and uh, moving forward. But having been part of the Rancho for three weeks before we shut down, I, uh, like Tom, am just, you know, anxious to get back and just be part of and get to know everybody, you know, better and be part of the group. Um, Maria, you probably have to show me what a weed is versus a plant, but I'm, I, you know, I, I can do physical labor, but that is not my, <laughs> my expertise. But I, you know, I'm ready to help and I would even be um, happy to greet guests and that type of stuff, being masked. I'm comfortable with that. So, Great. Yeah, so looking forward to it. All right, and you're keeping track of all those hours, though two of them have been tracking those hours, <laughs> doing lots of study, and they're going to be raring to go. Yeah, <laughs> but how quickly it leaves. It's, you know, it's kind of like cramming for that, that uh, the final exam when the time comes. Right, right. But thank you so much. I've so enjoyed this evening. Well, I'm glad you came. Am I on? Yes. Hello. I just want to say hi, you know, everybody's getting through this. Hopefully we can get back pretty quickly. Um, the garden pictures were gorgeous and they just want to make me like sit in that garden and walk through it. It was wonderful. Presentation, I learned a ton of things, thank you. And that's what part of this is all about is to learn and to share. And thanks a lot for everything. Thank you for what you do. And it's so great to see you new volunteers all here. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Fine. As you know, we walk down to the rancho at least five times a week. Good for you. Well, soon you might be able to walk right in. I know. We keep hoping. We Good. We'd be happy to see you. 
Oh, uh, Philip. Can I, say, can I get a word in? Uh, there yes, please. Yes. Okay. I, I'm, I'm real glad to see you folks uh, making progress here because we do. We really miss the rancho. Yeah, it's bad enough to be uh, yep. quarantined, but uh, then after after you spend so much time around the house doing all the things, you're looking forward to it. Uh, the idea of pulling weeds out there in the garden is probably a good one, but like uh, somebody already said, we need education in that area. I have become expert on it, however, <laughs> but I would hate to pull the wrong plant. Marie will definitely give you guidance if you decide to do that. Anybody? Elizabeth, are you waving your hand? Hi. Yes, I am waving. Can you hear me okay? Yep, I can. Uh, I know. I walk past the rancho almost every day. And uh, I'm very tempted to pick out, pull out what are obvious dandelions out in front of the gate. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I recognize dandelions. Is it, <laughs> would I be doing any harm, Marie, if I? I appreciate all help. <laughs> <laughs> I thought if I just pull three or four every morning, that would, uh, you know. <laughs> Those are three or four that I haven't pulled, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's plenty of work just outside the front gate, so I can only imagine what it's like inside the gates. <laughs> it's growing. <laughs> yeah. Thriving even. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi everyone. I just want to say the presentations were fantastic. I really enjoyed uh, Sarah's Tongva presentation. And Marie has a great, great knowledge of ballet music. Vivaldi is wonderful. And I loved all her images. Uh, kudos to you, Marie. Uh, Tessa, yes, I loved your presentation also. And Allison, and I always appreciate Alana, Laura, and Megan, and everyone else that has spoke here. And I look forward to starting to tour the general public, which I'm sure is in 2021. So thank you. Thank you, Diana. You see why I asked Diana to talk? She, you know, had all those wonderful things to say about us all. <laughs> Anybody else want to say hi before we move on to the last part of the evening? Well, it I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get my hand through the screensaver there. Oh, May yeah, I, Elizabeth. Um, is 2021, are you, are you folks just being conservative with the 2021 while hoping maybe it'll be before then? Phase four definitely will not be before 2021. Oh. Yeah. We're pretty sure about that. Wow. Yeah, but the 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 house will open for guided tours in phase three, which we anticipate will probably be before 2021. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. Yes, it's yes, but look at these two months have gone by so fast. It'll probably be 2021 before we know it. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hello. He was making a lot of noise earlier, but I think now he's, he's a little quieter. But here he is, eight months old tomorrow. <laughs> wow. Happy birthday, Nicholas. Happy birthday. <laughs> I, I am thrilled uh, that so many of you joined us tonight. Um, we do have a lot of information coming by email. You're actually gonna get probably two emails. One is a survey, because we wanna let you know. Um, the, uh, we wanna let you know, 
what the rollout plan is so you can have it in writing for the four phases and differentiating clearly between each of those. We also want to let you know where and how the volunteers uh, can volunteer in similar roles to what they filled in the past or brand new roles that we've never had in the past or newly reimagined roles um, given our current situation. So Laura will be sending that out. We also want to get your feedback on virtual gatherings. This is brand new for us. We did it last month, anticipating that we wouldn't be able to have our volunteer gathering. And lo and behold, we didn't know at that time we would be having more virtual gatherings because we would be at home for a longer period of time. But they're also, they have their own pluses and minuses. So we'll send you a little survey separate from the rollout plan with how volunteers can be integrated, we'll send you a little survey or provide the link in just a few minutes that you can let us know what your experience is with virtual gatherings, feedback and food for thought. We do have our next virtual gathering. We're now gonna tell you uh, on the second, I'm sorry, third Tuesday of the month in June. So the next virtual gathering for all volunteers will be Tuesday, June 16th at 5.30. And then on, uh, Laura mentioned earlier, we're doing a virtual coffee in the morning, just social gathering, no agenda. That's going to be next Wednesday, May 27th um, at 10.15 in the morning. Laura will send you these links, but just so you know what's going on. And finally, I want to um, tell you why I have this background, because I bet some of you are wondering, hey, Megan, that's not the Rancho. And plus, your glasses don't work very well with it. OK, but there's a reason for my background. Give me a sec, and I'll explain it. The Rancho as an institution. The Rancho as an institution is something that seeks to inspire, to engage, to educate, to preserve. Our goal in, in, do, in doing all of that is to, ins is to instill curiosity, curiosity about the past, curiosity for the future. Instilling curiosity, engaging, preserving, all of that can be kind of subsumed under one big word, and that's inspiration or inspiring. All right, here's my pitch for quick notes and why I have this background up. I find the background behind me hugely inspiring. Why? It's just kind of some crummy field, Megan. Well, it's an outdoor place that you can walk, but it happens to be the playground in my children's school. So school in itself and the opportunity to uh, be outside is inspiring. You probably can't see it, but somewhere over here is the shed that my older son made for his Boy Scout Eagle project uh, so that they could facilitate playground equipment for volunteering. But it was these tennis courts, the back tennis courts today that got me to take this picture because on one of them, well, two of them, somebody used spray paint, not my not my favorite, use spray paint to put a little inspirational note for everyone to see. And what it says is, a good dream begins with a dreamer. And I love it. A good dream begins with a dreamer. And it occurred to me, remember I told you this is a quick notes pitch too, that in the next quick notes, I think if everyone or as many people as want can share what inspires them, just like the Rancho inspires all of us, but what inspires and sustains you right now in these weird days? Is it a quote? Is it a poem? Is it an image? Is it something I haven't thought of? Um, that quote inspired me to think a good dream begins with a dreamer. And I hope for quick notes and just in any way you can, you can share with me, with us, with your fellow volunteers in the next quick notes. So get it to me by about, uh, We'll go with May 25th, but I'm good up a little bit beyond that. Something that inspires you, and I would appreciate that. All right, we do want to get that feedback. And so Mallory is putting in the chat here the link to the survey. Krista oh, is putting the, do you not have it, Mallory? No, it's already up in the Thank you. Click the chat. Click on that link and take our survey. Krista is putting that link out on the YouTube channel. But it will also come to you in the guise of an email if you don't feel like clicking on it and answering it right now. I think that's it for all of us. If we can all do a group wave. Thank you so much, every single one of you, even those who can't do a group wave for joining us tonight. It's really been a pleasure.
We'll see you soon at the Rancho and virtually. Good night.